There it is. And so I will uh, then propose that we start the, uh, this colloquium and uh, we'd like first to thank Edward to uh, <coughs> attend this, uh, unfortunately, uh, virtually, uh, but I'm glad that uh, despite his uh, very busy uh, time in Stockholm that he could find the time to give this uh, colloquium. So I give the floor now to Karim, who is going to introduce uh, Edward to you and then uh, uh, it is so cold that you need four vests in your back to go out. <laughs> it is Sweden. Uh, <laughs> <as well. laughs> it's over 20 degrees today. It, it's, it's very nice actually today. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, can I ask uh, everybody to um, unmute you uh, during the talk? And uh, if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand and uh, can we will then uh, coordinate uh, questions and answers. So the floor is yours, uh, Karim. Okay, so we are uh, delighted to have uh, Edward Marcel today uh, to talk about the uh, bolt tension, uh, local void and Cepheid systematics. Um, Edward is now a professor at uh, Stockholm University and the uh, Oscar Klein Center, uh, which is a place with, uh, with which uh, IAP has a lot of links, uh, if only because uh, Jens Jascher, which is a, a long time IAP collaborator, uh, is there. Uh, as well as uh, Irania Peris, uh, with whom we worked a lot uh, in the analysis of Planck. Uh, so we're really delighted to have uh, Edward here. Uh, Edward, you've been working on, uh, on many different topics uh, uh, related to the uh, analysis of, uh, of supernovae, uh, lensing, and uh, recently uh, uh, extended model of uh, different model of, uh, of gravity, which are all uh, very interested, uh, interesting and very relevant and uh, very interested for us at, uh, at IAP. Specifically here, you're going to talk about uh, the Hubble tension, which is a topic uh, we are uh, invested a lot uh, uh, at IAP only because uh, we were in charge of the analysis of Planck. And so we're really delighted to have you and uh, eagerly uh, wait for your talk. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karim, and thank you for having me. I, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't make it uh, to Paris at this time, but uh, yeah. That's how it is. So um, I uh, will switch gear a bit and talk about the, the growth curve of, of kids. Uh, not really, but, but the, the fact is that, I mean, if, if you're a parent and have kids, you, you, are, you are following this growth curve with, with some interest and, and hopefully you don't get any, uh, surprises that you don't want to see but, but and this is a bit similar to, to what we do with the with the universe that uh, our goal or one of the goals is is to find the growth curve of our universe and of, of course we, we are not able not at least not at this time maybe in the in the not too uh, uh, distant future maybe we can actually do this in, in real time as, as you do with, with our kids but but for now, we can't really do this, but what we do instead is that uh, we measure distances, which is basically the time since the light was emitted from the source that we observe. And we measure this as a function of redshift, which is directly related to the relative size of the universe. So by doing this, then we can trace out the growth curve of the universe. And then to measure cosmological distances, we need sources for which we can calibrate their size or their luminosity. So we call these standard candles or uh, standard rulers. Now, as a general rule, it's much easier to find sources for which we can assume that, uh, for instance, their luminosity does not change appreciably over the course of cosmic history. Although we might not know their absolute luminosity, uh, so one such example is the dot that you see in this galaxy here, a type 1a supernovae. Uh, but the fact that, that if we only measure sort of the relative luminosity of, of the, the sources, that, that gives us a very high precision on, on relative distances. Although the absolute distance turns out to be more difficult to, to, uh, to measure because then we actually need to know the absolute size or the absolute luminosity of these standard candles and, and rulers. So what then is the Hubble constant? Well, the Hubble constant is basically just the 
current fractional expansion velocity of the universe. So it's the, the, the derivative of the scale factor uh, when plotting the growth curve of our universe. Uh, so the cosmological distances that we measure, they are inversely proportional to H0, uh, which is also the key to measuring it. So basically, if we measure large absolute distances, that means that we have a low H0 and vice versa. Uh, so in general, in physics, we are not super interested in velocities, and, uh, but more interested in, in how velocities change. And of course, the reason for this is that the, the, the change of a velocity is uh, related to the forces acting on a system. And for the universe, uh, in this case, it's the force of gravity from the energy densities in the universe that, that uh, will make the universal expansion velocity to depend on time. Uh, so if you're only interested in the change of the expansion velocity, then it's enough to be able to measure relative distances. And that means that this is easier to do. And, and the, the different distance proofs that we have today, they more or less agree perfectly on, on the energy content of the universe. And, 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 the, and the change of the slope of it, this uh, velocity uh, of the expansion of the universe. So basically the picture that, that we have corresponds most closely to the, the, the purple line here that we had something that started out with a large expansion velocity and then this gradually slowed down. And this was due to the, the, the attractive force of the gravity that, that, that um, made the expansion slow down. But then after sort of half the lifetime of the universe, something happened, namely the expansion velocity started picking up speed again and it started accelerating. And the reason for this is believed to be that uh, while the matter was diluted by the expansion, there is a contribution from a cosmic constant or some other dark energy density, which is not diluted, which will then drive this uh, expansion velocity. So, uh, but then we're still left with the value of the Hubble constant. Uh, so in order to get this, we need to be able to measure absolute distances as, as I mentioned. So one, uh, and in order to do this, we need some source for which we know the, the size, the absolute size or the absolute luminosity. And one uh, such source is the cosmic microwave background. So if you look at the CMB temperature map, uh, we see small fluctuations and we have a prominent peak around the degree scale and the corresponding density fluctuations causing these temperature, temperature fluctuations are due to oscillations in the baryons and the photons that are being coupled through the frequent interactions in the, in the early universe. So if you look at the physical size of these oscillating regions, uh, they can be calculated as the distance a sound wave in this baryon photon plasma have a time to travel before the photons decouple. Uh, and if you compare this physical size to the angle they subtend on the sky, we then get the absolute, luminal, the absolute distance to the CMB last scattering surface. Uh, around the redshift of uh, 1090 approximately. So doing this exercise and observations, uh, what we get is a value for the Hubble constant, which is 67.4 plus minus 0.5 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So we should note here that, that this is a quite exact number. We have a sub percent precision on, on this number here. So, uh, there are other ways to measure the Hubble constant. We don't necessarily need to go to redshift of over 1000. We can try to make local measurements of the Hubble constant. Uh, so basically we, we refer to these small distance measurements as, as local estimates of the, of the Hubble constants. So doing this, we basically do this in the same way that was done, well, not quite, but close to 100 years ago by Hubble and other collaborators, including Westerslifer and Henrietta swan Leavitt, uh, Knut Lundmark, George Lemaitre. So, so, so the idea was basically to build up a local distance ladder using parallax distances, uh, Cepheid variable stars, galaxy sizes and luminosities, etc. 
So this is, is uh, the, the, the plot from Hubble's original paper. So uh, what then do we get from these local measurements? Well, what Hubble got was a very high value for different reasons. And if you plot the, 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 the value for H not as a function of time, then you get something like this. So we started out quite high, but then people, re, uh, then, then this went down. And for a long time, we had values ranging in the interval between sort of 50 to 100 kilometers per second per megaparsecs. Uh, so we can also note that in fact, when, when we do these local measurements today, we are not as local as Hubble was. In fact, we are starting our measurements uh, at a distance which is three times larger than Hubble's original measurement. And the reason is that now we don't know and understand that at the small distances employed by Hubble and collaborators, uh, there are large contributions from the peculiar velocities that, that, that makes these uh, measurements uh, very difficult. So um, state-of-the-art investigations today have sort of converged on a value in between these extreme values of 150 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And uh, investigations by the SHOES team uh, using type 1a supernovae typically out a redshift of about 1.15, uh, they give a value of 73 plus minus one kilometers per second per megaparsec. So this is the Hubble tension. Uh, it seems like if we compare the, the local measurement with the CMB measurement, we have two disparate values differing by almost 10%, uh, corresponding to something like a five sigma tension. So of course, it's not super important that the actual value that we get for the Hubble constant, uh, as long as it allows for an old enough universe to have time to form the structures that we, that, 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 that we see. Uh, but the differences that we get between these measurements might signal that there is something that we don't understand about our cosmic model. So, so in principle, th this could be a sign of some new physics going on that, that, that we don't understand completely. So of course there are other measurements of H naught. So I, 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 I've done a plot here where, where I, I compiled a few of them, but uh, the most important thing to note here is that the other values that we get from, from calibrating the type 1 supernova distance with, with the tip of the red giant branch measurements, for instance, they either happen to be right in between uh, the shoes and the, the, the Planck value for, for H naught, or in the case of, of lensing measurements, they have very large uncertainties. So, so the biggest tension is really between the, the, the value that you get uh, from calibrating type 1A supernova distances with Cepheids and the value that you get at large distances from, from the C and B observations. Uh, so the question is, which of these measurements are, is wrong or could it in fact be that both are right? So I, I, will, I will come back to this. Uh, so first, a few words about the C and B value for, for H naught that, that uh, I I know that uh, we have a lot of people in the audience that are experts in. Uh, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, the, the, the H not that in from, from CBO observations, uh, you get that from the temperature fluctuations in the CMB. Uh, so in order to get that, we need to calculate the physical size of these CMB fluctuations, and we need to measure the angular extent. So the physical size, is basically the distance a sound wave can, uh, in the barium photon plasma, have had time to travel uh, before the photons decouple. And of course, this will depend on the expansion velocity up until the point where the photons decouple. So basically the expansion velocity from the big bang up to redshift of a uh, uh, thousand approximately. But then, of course, we also need to take into account that the, the, the expansion rate is not constant. So, so in order to, to get the current expansion rate of the, of the Hubble constant that we infer, you also need to have a model for how this expansion rate changes with time uh, up to redshift of 10,090. So it means that it also depends on, on, on the growth curve uh, between redshift of a thousand and a redshift of zero. So basically the CMB measurement is sensitive to the entire expansion history of the universe. Uh, 
so this, of course, makes it an ideal playground for theorists. Uh, but in spite of much effort, it has turned out to be surprisingly hard uh, to, uh, to change the inferred Hubble constant by much without violating other observational constraints, uh, including other CMB futures related to the horizon size at this point, and also intermediate redshift probes. Because uh, if you look at, at these small fluctuations uh, in the density at the redshift of a thousand, this will also be imprinted in the, in the large scale galaxy distribution uh, in what is called the barren acoustic oscillations or, or bow. Uh, only that, that, that they will be increased by, by, by the, the, the expansion. Uh, but also we have other distance measurements, for instance, from this type 1 supernovae that also gives us good constraints on, on, on the expansion rate that we have uh, uh, between us and the rate shift of 1000. <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> so another way to show this tension is basically to <clears throat> show uh, the, the Hubble parameter, which is uh, the expansion rate of the universe as a function of the redshift. And this gray band here basically shows uh, the, the, the value that you get in, in the concordance lambda CDM model from, from the uh, Planck measurements. And compared to these intermediate probes where we have an imprint of these baryon acoustic oscillations also in the large scale galaxy distributions at, at lower redshifts. But you can see, when you take into account the, the, the evolution of, of the Hubble constant, it lands at a value which is lower than the value that, that you get from the local measurements of the type 1a supernovae. So I, I should also mention here that, that the value that, that I gave you for the, for the local value from the Schultz collaboration uh, <clears throat> of 73, this is uh, with a data set which is not uh, public available yet. So, so in, in, in much of what I will show Coming up next, I, I have used the, what is public available, which is a data set which is, is smaller than the one which is currently used by the Schultz collaboration. So uh, what I will now do for the remainder of the talk, given that it has been so difficult to, to change this curve that you can derive from the CMB measurements, is basically just to uh, make the assumption that the CMB measurement is correct. And then let's see if, if we can do anything to sort of uh, re-evaluate the local value that we have, or if we can actually devise a model where both of these measurements can be right. Mm. So how would it then be possible to have these two different values for the Hubble constant to, to be correct? Well, <clears throat> one possibility is that uh, we might live in a region of the universe where the current expansion rate is actually larger than its surroundings. Uh, so <clears throat> how, how, why, why would this be the case? <clears throat> well, we don't know that matter in the universe <clears throat> is not distributed <clears throat> perfectly homogeneously. <clears throat> and um, of course, this is the case for <clears throat> stars and galaxies, but this is also the case for the large scale distribution of, of, of galaxies. So we know that uh, on very large scales, on scales larger than about 100 megaparsecs, uh, we can assume that, that, that to a fair approximation, the universe is homogeneous. And this, of course, makes it much easier to solve the, the field equations uh, and to derive the expansion rate of the universe. But the question then is, <clears throat> Can this expansion rate be uh, affected by this inhomogeneity that we see? So one thing that people have been looking into is <clears throat> whether it's possible that this inhomogeneity can actually sort of back react to the to the large scale expansion that we have, and this has turned out to be a very difficult subject, and people have uh, uh, found conflicting results. So I, I will leave it at that. And the reason is that it's it's it's. Uh, it's not possible to find exact solutions to the Einstein field equations in this case. But fortunately, there is a case where we can actually find an exact solution. And this is the case where we have uh, one spherically symmetric void. Uh, so the idea then would be that if we happen to live close to the center to one of these spherically symmetric voids, 
Then the fact that uh, if we would have less matter here, the expansion rate would have not decreased as much than in its surrounding, then we could actually have a higher expansion rate locally. And that could possibly then be an explanation for why we measure a locally different expansion rate than we get from the uh, large distance CMB measurements. So does this make any sense? Well, there has been some indications if you look at uh, uh, galaxy luminosity densities, and if you use this to derive some density contrast, then, then some teams have found some hints that, that we actually might have a, a local under density. And also if you look at, at the, the cluster density distributions, there have been similar hints that, that, that our local environment is, is a bit less dense than, than its surroundings. Um, so this made us a bit curious and, and others also that, uh, okay, maybe if we make a model where we allow for a, a local under density or even an over density, could that actually explain the tension that we see between the locally inferred and the CMB inferred value of, of the Hubble constant? Uh, <clears throat> so be, be, before doing that, I have to say a few words on how we do this uh, locally inferred value of, of the Hubble constant. Uh, so, <clears throat> so when we measure the, the, the when we measure distances to, to type 1e supernova, for instance, uh, what we measure is the magnitude of the source. And then from the magnitude, we can derive a logarithmic measure of the distance, the, the distance modulus. Uh, but of course, this will also depend on the absolute magnitude of, of the source in question. So, but when you try to infer the energy content of the universe, we don't really care about the normalization of this curve. Again, we only care about relative distances. And that means that we only care about the redshift evolution of, of the observed magnitudes of our standard sources, our standard candles. And that's fine. But, but if we want to measure the Hubble constant, we also need to know the absolute magnitude of, of our standard candle, in, in this case, the, the type 1a supernovae. So uh, the problem is that uh, in order to get the absolute magnitude of a type 1a supernova, we need an absolute distance to at least one type 1a supernova. And we don't have that. So this is where the Cepheids enter the game. Uh, so basically, if we, um, we do have Cepheids in galaxies where we have type 1e supernovae. So that means that if we would know the absolute magnitude of, of Cepheids, then we would, could infer the absolute magnitude of type 1e supernovae. And that would then allow us to, to get the uh, Hubble expansion rate. So now we have around 40 type 1e supernovae observed in galaxies where we also have uh, observations of, of Cepheids. Once you note that these type 1a supernovae, they are not far enough to, to be good measures of, of the actual uh, expansion rate, but from these 40 supernovae, then, then one could get the, the, the absolute magnitude of the type 1 supernovae, and then one could look at the type 1 supernovae at larger distances to infer the, the current expansion rate of the universe. Okay, so then we need the absolute magnitude of the Cepheids, but um, that means that we need an absolute distance to at least one galaxy where uh, one galaxy where we have uh, Cepheid observations, and this uh, and one such example is our own Milky Way, where we actually have uh, parallax distances to these Cepheids. So that's basically how the distance ladder work. We measure absolute distances to Cepheids in the Milky Way or to some other galaxy uh, that gives us the absolute magnitude of the Cepheids, which in turn gives us the absolute magnitude of the Type One A. Supernovae. So uh, then we can start building up our distance ladder, and it, uh, their end result uh, can look something like this. So basically, here we have our anchor galaxies. We have the Milky Way. We have the LMC. Uh, we have NGC 4258. You could possibly use M31, but there are some uncertainties with these distance measurements. Uh, but this gives us absolute magnitude of the Cepheids that we can put on this diagram of the distance modulus. And then this gives us the, 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 dist, the absolute distances to the type 1a supernovae. So th th that's the idea. Uh, 
So, so basically, one way to rephrase the Hubble tension is uh, to say that the Hubble tension is really the value of the absolute magnitude of the type 1a supernova that, 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 that you get. So you get one value for the absolute magnitude of the type 1a supernova from building up this local distance ladder. But you can also get uh, an estimate of the absolute magnitude of the type 1a uh, supernovae by going the other way, namely by using the distance to the C and B and the, the barren acoustic oscillations and then infer what, what the absolute magnitude should be. So one could rephrase this, uh, that the Hubble tension is also tension basically between the absolute magnitude of type 1a supernovae inferred from local measurements or from the large distance measurements. Uh, so now we're ready to go back to our uh, model where, where we want to investigate whether actually both of these values can be true. So in doing this, basically what we, we follow the, the prescription that you do for this local distance ladder, only that we also allow for having a local under or over density. So this is just some, a few examples. So the delta and the epsilons here, there are different models for, 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 for how this uh, density variation, the spherical asymmetric density variation might appear. And we can see here that if you have an under density, this will correspond to a higher local expansion rate of the universe. Uh, so, so then uh, we just do, do the, the, the local distance ladder fit, uh, including this more general uh, model for the density uh, variations in the local universe. And uh, let's see what we get here. So uh, let's concentrate here on the, the blue contours. Uh, so basically what, what we see then is that delta here is an indication of sort of the fractional depth of, of, of the local density compared to its surroundings. What you can see here that, that I mean, in principle, it's possible to have something like a 10% deviation uh, from, from the average density in the universe, but it's consistent with having zero uh, local density variations. And if you look at the inferred value of, of the absolute magnitude of a type 1a supernovae, what you get is a value around minus 19.4. And of course, this might not tell you very much, but what we can do then is that we com can compare this value uh, for the absolute magnitude of the supernovae to what we would get using exactly the same data set, but in the lambda CDM model. And this is then what we get. GG is our general model where we allow for a matter in homogeneity. Then you get mi minus 19.4. If in our lambda CDM model, we get minus 19.41. So you can see that, that uh, it's almost exactly the same value. And this is due to the fact that we actually have a very, we can only allow for a very, very shallow uh, void here. So that means that, okay, it did not work, uh, so too bad. But on the other hand, this is good because then we know that allowing for local board will not affect the local estimate of the Hubble uh, constant appreciably. So, so, so it, this will not be a major systematic. So uh, what else could work then? Well, <clears throat> of course th this, um, Having a very large and deep local void is a bit of a non-standard explanation, as is attempts to sort of change the CMB value by, 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 by changing the expansion rate either before CMB decoupling or after. So, so basically this amounts to having some kind of energy injected, unknown energy component injected in, in, in the universe. Uh, so, so, but what I will know now, now is just to try to see if there could be some more boring explanation. Uh, and uh, the boring explanation is, of course, if, if uh, there are some things, some systematic uncertainties that, that, that might make uh, the, the local inferred value of H not uh, completely reliable. <clears throat> So the thing is that in getting the local value of H naught, we have to build up this distance ladder. So that means that any error at any step in this distance ladder will propagate to the inferred value of H naught. So that means we really need to make sure that, that there is nothing fishy going on in, in any of these steps. Uh, so so let's, let, let's look at, at a few 
possibilities. So, so one thing which is very important is that uh, that uh, Cepheids and Type 1 supernovae, they, they are not perfectly standard candles as is. You actually have to calibrate them uh, for a few different things. One, one thing is that uh, if you look at the light curve of Type 1 supernovae, it turns out that uh, that type 1 supernova with, with broad light curves, they, they tend to be much brighter than, than uh, supernova with, with very narrow light curves. Uh, so this is something you have to correct for, and this can be done successfully. It's the same with the Cepheids. If you look at the period of a Cepheid, this is closely connected to the luminosity of a Cepheid. So this is also something that you have to correct for. The other thing that you have to correct for is the fact that if you have a source, uh, the, the, the luminosity is expected to be correlated with its color. And um, I mean, one obvious reason is, is the same as, as the reason why, why, why the sun looks redder at sunset. Uh, and th this is because the, 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 the shorter wavelength light will be more scattered by, by dust and, and other particles in between us and the source. Uh, so that means that uh, if you have something that looks red, you need to uh, you need to correct for the possibility of this being due to dust uh, extinction. So uh, this, of course, has to be done both for Cepheids and for Type One A supernovae. But, but let's start at at the Cepheids. So what we can do then is that uh, to minimize the, this uh, effect from 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 dust extinction. We, we, can, we, can, we can go to measurements in, in the near infrared where we expect the, the, the effect to be less prominent, but then we can do this correction and we do this correction in, in, with respect to, the, the, to some color in, in, the, in the optical. <clears throat> but there is a parameter that, that, that sort of governs this uh, correction here denoted RE. And uh, so of course to do this, you have to assume or fit a value for RE. So RE would then be um, closely connected to the properties of the dust, which is uh, responsible for, for the extinction. Uh, basically, RE here tells us if you have some amount of extinction giving some color excess in, in the optical, how will this propagate into the near infrared? So if you do this, uh, if you try to infer this from, from this different measurements, you, you get uh, very different results. So basically what I denote by RE here is basically the, the, the extinction in the H-band that you get from uh, looking at the V minus one I color in the optical. Uh, this is not always how we, how we infer dust properties. Normally you just look at this how how uh, in, in the optical by comparing the color B minus V, how this affects the V band. Uh, so what you can do then is you can translate between these two different things and you can do this by assuming some dust extinction law. So this is what is done in this graph here using a, a Fitzpatrick result from 2019. So, so the main thing here is that there is an uh, uncertainty in doing this conversion between the, the RVBV and the RHVI that we use for the Cepheids, but also in the measured values of the RVBV, you can get very different results depending on what kind of probes you, you look at. So for instance, this, this dark brown curve is for stars in the Milky Way, uh, whereas this uh, lighter brown curve is for uh, the observed extinction of type 1 supernovae. Uh, so the main thing here is that, that we do believe that there are some uh, large uncertainties in the value of this. So what the Schultz collaboration are doing, that they are, they are assuming a, a, a fixed global value for this parameter RE, for how, how you do this color extinction corrections of one point, uh, 0.4 approximately, corresponding to close to the Milky Way value RBV of approximately three. So what we wanted to do was to get, uh, not use this fixed global value, but actually fit for the value of RE from the data at hand, from the CIFI data at hand. So what, what do we get from this then? Uh, and wh wh why, why do we even care? Well, the thing is that we care because if it turns out that this, that if dust properties are different in the anchor galaxies, that is the, 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 the CIFID galaxies where we have absolute distance measurements true, 
compared to the Cepheid galaxies where we have type 1a supernovae, if there are some systematic offsets between the dust properties there, you will actually infer very different values for the Hubble constants. So basically you can see if Re happens to be much lower in the type 1a host galaxies compared to the anchor galaxies, then you get much lower values for H0. So of course, this could be a simple solution. Let's just assume that this is the case and, and then, then this is solved. But this is not what we want to do. We actually wanted to fit for the value of RE in each of the individual galaxies that, that we have in, in the data set. And then this is what you get. So the dotted line here is the, the, the constant global value, which is assumed by the Schultz collaboration for RE. But we can see when we try to fit for the value of RE, we do get something which is very close for this for the Milky Way, Cepheids, but we have a large scatter for all the other galaxies. So this means that this will introduce an additional uncertainty in the derived value of the Hubble constant that we get locally. So, and, and now we have to remember that this value is derived from an older data set, not, not, not the one which is uh, now used by the Schultz collaboration, because that's not public available. But basically we can see what, what we get then is a value of 73.9 plus minus 1.8. So we get a larger uncertainty. So this amounts with a 3.4 tension with a Planck value. Uh, so, uh, there are some additional uncertainties that, that we have for the for the Cepheid calibration. Uh, one thing is that we don't really know how much of the, the color of the Cepheids are due to dust extinction and how much is due to intrinsic variations in, in, in the in the Cepheids. So, so basically the, it's Cepheids, they, they have can have a small variation in the temperature. And that means that if you have a higher temperature Cepheid, uh, you would expect this to be uh, th this. You would expect this to be brighter, and th that means that 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 you also expect. That means that you also from the intrinsic temperature variation, you expect uh, uh, a red cepheid to have lower lum luminosity than, than a bluer cepheid. And then there are also some uncertainties corrected to the metallicity corrections, but because uh, you can also make a correction trying to take into the fact that it might be the case that, that Cepheids in high metallist environments ha have uh, higher luminosities than Cepheids in low luminosity environments. A third thing that, that is quite interesting is that, uh, of course, the Cepheids are used to get the absolute magnitude of, of the type 1a supernovae. But if you just take the type 1a supernovae one by one that we have with, with the uh, Cepheid data, then you get an individual value of H0 for each of these type 1a supernovae. And you can see that there is quite a large scatter in, in the inferred value of H0 that you get for each of these type 1a supernovae. And of course, the majority will be quite high, but also a very large fraction will be perfectly compatible with, with the CMB value. But the main thing here is that it seems like the scatter might is a bit larger than you would statistically expect. Uh, so that means that, that, that also the, the type 1a supernova uncertainties might be slightly underestimated. So if you also take into account these additional uncertainties, then we get another uh, value. Well, we get the same value for H0, but we get the slightly increased uncertainty for the, for the value again, which lowers the, the, the tension with the Planck value to below three sigma in this case. So, <clears throat> so, so this is sort of uh, looking at the, the Cepheid uncertainties and the possible type 1 uncertainties. One thing that we haven't really mentioned is, can we trust the absolute distance measurement to the anchor galaxies? Uh, so we can do the same thing as we did for the individual type 1 supernova. We can look at if we do not use all of our anchor galaxies, let's just use them one at a time and, and see what value we infer for the Hubble constant. Then this is what you get. So here, the black curve is what you get for the NGC 4258 anchor galaxy. Uh, this uh, greenish curve is what you get for the, for the Milky Way galaxy. And the, the petrol curve is what you get for the LMC galaxy. So what you can see then is that 
the Milk Way seems to stick out that it actually, that, that this seems to drive the high value that we get for the Hubble constant, whereas, for instance, the NGC 4258 seems to be quite compatible with, with the low result that you get from the, from the Planck data. So um, now to get to use the Milky Way Cepheids uh, as an absolute distance indicator, we, we, we do that by, by using the parallax measurements from Gaia uh, for these Cepheids. But, but we know that, that there are some, uh, there could be some biases in, in measuring the parallaxes, both generally, but definitely for these very high luminosity objects that, that we have for the Cepheids. Uh, so that there are, uncertainties in this uh, uh, parallax measurements that, that you get from, from measuring the parallaxes uh, from the Cepheids directly because of the, their um, high luminosity. So of course, one other thing that one can do, and I think we have uh, Louise in the audience here, is that, uh, and she can maybe comment on this, an interesting alternative is not to use the Cepheids themselves, but to use either the if they have some binary companion or use uh, the, 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 the cluster that, that they sit in to, to, to have these sources uh, and measure the parallaxes to them instead to infer the, the distances to the, the Cephids themselves. So uh, when we do this, uh, so, so basically we, uh, we just use the Cephids for which we have independent measurements of, of their, their distance using lower luminosity probes, then you can actually see that you get a, a lower value of the Hubble constant, in this case, 71.9 plus minus 2.2. So then we are down to two sigma tension with a, with a Planck value. Of course, another alternative way is just to skip the Milky Way altogether, and then you get something actually which is quite similar. You get a slightly lower value with a slightly higher uncertainty. So on the note of, of, of the Milky Way, uh, I told you that, that um, one very important uh, calibration you have to do is with respect to the, the inferred color excess that you have for the Cephids. If, if you plot the color excess for the different galaxies that we use when, when, when inferring the local Hubble constant, you can see that you get quite different distributions uh, in the different galaxies. And for instance, if you look at the, the Milky Way galaxy, it really sticks out with having uh, redder Cepheids th than the other galaxies, including the Type 1 host galaxies in, in Petrol here, and the NGC 4258 anchor and the LMC anchor galaxy. So this is something that, that uh, it's not ideal. Of course, if we want to build up a distance ladder by combining data in different galaxies, we, we want very similar samples in, in all of our galaxies. So this is something we, which is not really what we want to have these uh, different uh, uh, Cepheid properties in the different galaxies that we use, because this could definitely introduce some systematic effects that, 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 that we don't want. Um, so th this made us wanted to look into the question of what happens if you actually do not keep all of the Cephids in, in the, that, that we have in our samples here. So for instance, what, what one could do is that one could think about cutting out the red Cephids because we know that the, the red Cephids, they, they will have more dust extinction and they will be more sensitive to actually to the calibration that we make with respect to the, the, the derived color excess that we have for the Cephids. So then what we attempted to do was basically just to uh, see how the inferred local Hubble constant depends on us introducing a color cut where we cut out the red Cephids. So what you then see that in fact, you, you, you find a value which will depend very much on where you introduce your color cut on these Cephids. And uh, um, so, so in fact, if, if you if you would introduce a color cut, which is that you threw away the Cephids, which have intrinsic color excesses in excess of 0.15 magnitudes, uh, then you get the Hubble constant, which is in fact uh, very similar to the the value you get for the for the 
from the Planck observations. So um, the conclusions. We have found that if you try to explain the Hubble tension by actually having two different values for the Hubble constant by introducing a local board, this will not be very successful. But we did find that we think that there are some systematic errors in the local measurements that might be underestimated. So for instance, one thing is that the Milky Way sticks out by giving a higher value for the Hubble constant, but this is also more, uh, could be less reliable due to the parallax uncertainties. But we also found that uh, there, there are large differences uh, between the, 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 the Cephi properties in the different galaxies we use by building up this distance ladder. And this inomidineous Cephi selection might bias the local infrared H knot. So for instance, we've seen that if we introduce a cut where we cut out the, the reddest Cephids, th this might actually change the Hubble constant by, by quite a lot. So of course, um, ideally I would like to be able to give you um, sort of our final take on what is the value of the Hubble constant, but uh, um, I think at this point, at least uh, I'm not comfortable in, in giving one single value for this, but I will only note that, uh, that I think that uh, the different systematic uncertainties that we've investigated might currently inhibit us from measuring the Hubble constant to the precision that is required to, to really, really claim a substantial tension with the value that we derive from the Planck data. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So, so yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, wonderful. Thanks a lot. So I think we can uh, take a few questions now. So while people are... So Louise, uh, Louise Breval, would you like to, uh, to ask a question or perhaps give a, a few more uh, explanation on, on this parallax issue, please? Uh, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you, Edward, for the uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I had just a few questions. Uh, the first is uh, when you show the Hubble constant for the different anchors, so for NGC 4258, the Milky Way and the LMC, I was very surprised to see uh, that for NGC 4258, uh, the value is very close to the Planck value. That's very surprising. Uh, what are these values? Because in the last shoes paper, uh, these three anchors are uh, very consistent. So that's, that's my first question. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yes, and the reason for this is that, uh, as you remember, we allow for having uh, different dust properties in the different galaxies. Basically, we allow for this RE parameter to vary between the galaxies. And this is the reason why, if you do allow for this, uh, you, get another, you get a different result for the NGC 4258 uh, compared to if you just assume a fixed global value. Okay. Um... Then my other question is that when you mention the correction of the color, it seems to me that removing very red cephids uh, would uh, give you a very small sample and reduce a lot the maybe the accuracy of the PL relation calibration. So at the end, yes, on this plot, uh, on the left side of this plot, is it really? Uh, is it really uh, safe to give a very low value of the Hubble constant um, if you remove all of these cephids? Uh, and for example, in the Milky Way, uh, you would have almost no cephids at, at this regime. Uh, and also, I think we need to uh, make some assumptions. If you, if you assume that you cut these colors, uh, you need to um, correct also for the, when you correct for the crowding, you need to apply the same assumptions and then you need to cut the same colors uh, when you uh, throw artificial stars to correct for the crowding. Is it something that is done here? Uh, yeah, okay, so, so the first question first. Yeah, yeah it, it is true that if you introduce this color cut, you do cut out a lot of the cephids. And especially in terms of the Milky Way, I mean, when you're down to 0.15, there are basically no Milky Way cephids left. Uh, but as you noted here, I mean, the error bars does not 
really increase by that much unless you make a really aggressive cut here. And the reason is that, that the uncertainty is H not is really, you know, the statistical error is really driven by the error that you get from the type 1A supernovae. So in terms of the Cepheids, the big worry for us is not uh, the having a statistically large sample, but rather the, the systematic effects. Uh, so, so th yeah, so that's the reason for this. Then, then the other question is about, uh, no, no, we, we have not. Uh, so yeah, so I had some uh, email conversation with, with Adam Rees uh, uh, about this. And he was worried that, uh, that if you introduce a color cut, you actually have to, if you want to do this consistently, you also have to take into account that this might uh, change the, 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 the more specifically the, the color error that you have in the optical because the, you, you will have different estimate for the crowding effects, exactly as you said. This has not been introduced here, but, but the, the thing is that, uh, uh, yeah, so actually, I, I cannot at this point say how important that effect is for, for a plot like this. Although, I mean, the reason why you get a lower value for H0 while, while cutting out the, the reddest uh, Cephids uh, is due to the fact that you have some residual, uh, uh, residual scatter in, in the magnitudes with different signs for the anchor and for the host galaxies. We, and this fact will be independent of. of uh, of uh, the, the crowding effects. So yeah, but I, I'm very much interested in looking into the, whether this is an important effect or not. Uh, before you keep, uh, yes, uh, I, I had a follow-up question on this one. When you start cutting uh, for colors, aren't you artificially uh, selecting uh, uh, some particular anchors? I mean, uh, or, or, the, uh, or is the color uh, correlated with the, uh, with the anchors you're using? So indeed, as you said, when you start cutting a lot, the, the, the reddest one, you, you just removing entirely the Milky Way uh, uh, surface. Yeah. But what about the others? Yeah, I mean, the, the others are more similar in terms of the color distribution. But, but for sure, I mean, this is what happens, for, especially for the Milky Way. This is just amounts of cutting away the Milky Way data. And, but, but the important thing, I'm not saying that you should cut at 0.15, you should cut at 0.25. The thing is that regardless of how you cut the data, you will still have an inhomogeneous Cepheid sample, unfortunately. So I, I don't have a good solution for this. No, but the, 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 question, the question is, uh, uh, I mean, when, when you do that, you're changing the weights of your different anchors, right? Yeah, yeah, and, I am. How does this weight uh, changes and isn't, what explain entirely the trend you see here? Yeah, I mean, what, I mean, the explanation for the trend is basically that that including all the Cephids and you do your full fit or everything, you, you can still see that, 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 that there are some, I mean, ideally, if, if you have a perfect color correction, you will not, you will not see the effect that the, the red Cephids are slightly dimmer or and the blue Cephids are slightly, you, you will have corrected for this. But the thing is, even if you do this correction as good as you can, you still have some residuals. And these residuals tend to have different signs in the host and the anchor galaxies, uh, which means that, that you actually, when you start cutting out the data, th this will uh, change the, the, the relative distances between the anchors and the host, and this will change the value of H naught. So, um, no, I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, it would be great if you could actually introduce some cuts that do, you would make the Cephid selection very homogeneous, but uh, I, I haven't been able to find that, unfortunately. Uh, Alain, you had a question as well? Uh, yes, thank you. It, it's related to the same subject. I think you show the uh, distribution of the color of Cepheids between different anchor and, and, and what, yes, that, that's, that's the one, thank you. So it's related to the discussion we have. Do we understand from the astrophysics why the color of the Cepheids are so different between two galaxies? I, I think the Milky Way, I mean, the reason for the Milky Way is basically that we see them through the disk and uh, there's not much we can do about this. Uh, I mean, to extent, which is to a much higher extent than we do for these extra galactic Cepheids. So, so again, I think it, it's sort of well understood why this is the case, but, but uh, that doesn't really help since it's still a very inhomogeneous uh, sample. 
So that, that would mean that the, the galactic mil, uh, mil, the Milky Way CFAIs are, are biased in their selection. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they are biased that, that they generally have a higher uh, dust extinction, more dust extinction than the, the other galaxies. Yes. Thank you. Uh, any other question? Otherwise, I have another one. Okay. So on the uh, uh, increase of uh, of our bars, you've, so, you've shown us different. Uh, uh, Different issues with the estimation of the orbars, uh, saying that you uh, you need to extend them uh, because of the uh, dust, etc. Uh, what means that the, the interest is indeed to uh, to decrease those orbars? Uh, what extra data would we need to uh, to actually achieve the uh, precision claimed by the shoes and other teams? Yeah, I think that that. Uh... The problem, at least for me, uh, is that basically we have one color, B minus I, and that color is used to sort of infer the magnitude in the near infrared H band. Of course, if we would have multiple colors, then you could start doing these uh, color corrections with much higher confidence, definitely. So, so I, I think that if uh, one would have, um, Basically, Cepheid data with in more filters that, that would help a lot. Uh, I mean, for, at least for me, that that would be the main uh, thing that that would give me more confidence in the results. But but, but of course, I mean, we have Cepheid data where we have multi wavelength data. But the thing is that, of course, what the shoe teams have, have have prioritized is to have everything done with the HST to sort of minimize any systematic calibration phase like that. So. And, and can we get back to the, uh, perhaps we want to comment on the uh, uh, issue with, uh, with parallaxes? Yeah. Louise, could, could you comment? Uh, yes, <clears throat> uh, I have done a similar analysis uh, in my thesis. Uh, so uh, as Edward said, we use companions and clusters and we do get with uh, with DR2 and with DR3, uh, a similar Hubble constant of 73. So, uh, but we do not claim that there is additional systematics because we believe that the Gaia EDR3 zero point is uh, actually well calibrated. Of course, it's not perfect, uh, but uh, we do not think it introduces more uh, systematics on that. So uh, that's my comment. Okay. Any other question before we, we close this seminar? So uh, if not, uh, I think we should thank again, uh, Edward. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice talk. Thank you. Very interesting. And I uh, hope to have you uh, at IAP the next time. Yes, definitely. Uh, goodbye to everyone, I, I guess. Uh, Bye-bye.